is uh, I say that the, the following uh, slide presentation is going to deal with structure situations. Structure situations found on various lakes and reservoirs throughout the country. And then I'll click it over. And I'll say and this information can only be had at the Spoon Plugging Training Center. You can only get this kind of information from the Spoon Plugging Training Center. You don't want me to make it more formal than that, right? No, you're just you know, just like, like yeah, you just, you yeah, know, okay. Like you, do it and, like you do it. Oops. And this is a new slide that Jerry made up, okay? And uh, this can pretty much tells the story, you know, okay? Here. Watch yourself. <laughs> You got a long enough cord, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, I'm a lot shape. <laughs> okay, sorry. And then, then we like to say that uh, the spoon, the, the structure situations, and the spoon plugging guidelines go hand in hand. And we're going to deal with what well, what's involved here in all our seminars and stuff is the, the the basic guidelines, okay? And then you go through them, you know, one through eight. Even though the guy's an advanced student, you know, he may he may not have read this. For a long time okay so you give them a little reminder on that and you move right along and um, describe what structure is you know what the guideline is okay and it's right up there on the slide for you okay <clears throat> then of course what buck says it's very important you know to go over this particular uh, uh, paragraph here a long sentence, okay? So that that gets them on the right track, gets them thinking that these fish are going to be moving and they're, you know, going to be doing this and doing that. And then, of course, our introductory slide. Structure, breaks, break lines, deep water features, fish use in their movements and migrations. They don't have much to repeat there. Then you talk about the 17 structure situations. And there's no need to talk about all 17 of them. Just say the difference between a natural lake and, a, and a, a reservoir is that a natural lake may only have two or three or four of these 17 basic structure situations. You've got to say that, of course, that there's basically 17 structure situations that you run into on a reservoir or a natural lake. And a natural lake may only have three or four of these, where a reservoir could have all 17 or 11 out of the 17. You, you know what I mean? For instance, Hickory has no riprap at the dam. So it wouldn't have that, okay? And you move on and you describe this stuff, talk briefly on it. You know, what breaks are, what, uh, what uh, you know, like uh, number one is structure. What is structure, you know? And then what are breaks? And it, it's got everything on there, sunken boats, stumps, rocks, breaks on the structure, okay? Breaks on the, and a break line. What's a, a, an increase or decrease in depth, however you want to look at it, you know? And the deep water. Uh, deep water is very important because the structure situation has to always extend to the deepest water in the area. And then you remind them, this doesn't mean the deepest water in the lake, the deepest water in the area, okay? And then we get to the most common structure situation, which is the bar. And uh, you can see the writing is underneath there. You get time to study the, the slide and you get to know exactly what, how Buck refers to this most common type bar. Now this bar could appear in a natural lake or a reservoir. And again, as you see it, it, it looks like the deep water is right off the end of it, like many of the figures that we use, okay? Then it gives a picture of it. Uh, and you, right here, you tell them, um, how important it is to start to observe the shoreline terrain, to know that the, when you look at this out on the water, especially in these big reservoirs, that a structure situation such as this one could exist there. All indications are by reading the shoreline terrain with the hazard marker and the long ridge coming out, that, that, that the structure situation could be in that area, and chances are it is. And again, you describe it again, okay? It indicates there's a structure situation, all right? Then we take it the most common bar in the reservoir. And you see the channel come along the shoreline, forming a steep shore, and then as the channel swings out, begins to cut across the lake, we wind up with the long ridge type structure, okay? And then you might mention right now that note the arrows, channel break lines, the sharp breaks 
will occur on the side that the channel's on. Your efforts, your, you should concentrate your efforts after your, your contour trolling with the three small sizes. And they should know all about the three small sizes. Only the advanced course people see this, okay? So after you're done running the 400, 500, and the 250, your straight line passes should be in accordance with the channel brake line now. On that side, you don't belong on the other side, okay? They concentrate their efforts where the fish are. This would give them an idea of a, a low water situation where the original creek channel, there you see it running through there, and you see the big flat, you see the bars and, and the turns and everything that forms the structure situations. And the channel is the key to the whole thing. It forms and makes those structure situations. And again, here too, it shows it again, low water. These are low water slides, okay? This is just another slide to remind them. You know, they're all the same. They may look a little different. One may go to the left, one may go to the right. One may be longer than the other one, but the basic principle is the same always. Then we get to the steep shores. There's always some questions about steep shores, especially in a reservoir, uh, what to look for. Where's the structure at? Well, it's still in a form of a bar, a ridge-type structure. And what you look for is the dirt rather than the rock. When you find the dirt, you find where the where the the wash the, the uh, let me stop you here. The wash, when you find the dirt, you find where the rocks and and trees and everything has been washed into the reservoir down this wash, and that's what formed the structure situation. That's what formed the bar, and it's very important to do this if you're in a highland type situation, because it could be a mile or so between washes. And it would be a lot of trolling water, where by observing the shoreline terrain as you ride down the lake or reservoir, and you observe the shoreline terrain, these washes are easy to spot. And instead of trolling for a mile to find the next one or relying on the lure, your, your eyeballs will tell you where it's at, okay? And then it shows it. When you see something like this and you're out in the boat, it's time to take a look at it. That indicates that there should be a slide or a wash, which will give us the, about as much structure as we can hope for on the, on the steep shoreline. Again here, here's a cave-in. And that, that cave-in that you see right there, uh, that, that indicates that a structure situation is going to exist right there. And this is an excellent slide. It shows the, the wash, and this is low water again. And we see the bar that was created by it. Now, this one's a pretty good size one. And uh, as, as Buck said, in this California reservoir, you may, you may call attention to this, the next one was about a mile away. So it's very important to observe that terrain. Saddles, um, there's a lot of conversation about saddles. Is a saddle a structure situation uh, or isn't it? Well, it's a structure situation if it's associated in some manner with deep water and, of course, by brake lines. Uh, some saddles may have sanctuary depth. <coughs> you may say, <coughs> sanctuary depth, does that mean 35 to 40 feet? Well, <coughs> you call attention to this. In a dark water reservoir, if you've got good water color, you, and you had 35 to 40 feet in the saddle, that could be sanctuary depth. But let's turn that around and make it a clear water reservoir. That's not deep enough for sanctuary depth. So that would be your main concern as far as sanctuary depth. You could say that the sanctuary in a dark water reservoir could be in the saddle or may perhaps will be in the saddle. But in a clear water lake, that would not be the case. The, the, the contact point would be off to the side where the fish come up from, a deep, from the deeper water and hit the saddle and then you call attention to the fact that observe the saddle this is what it looks like if you were going to make trolling passes into that saddle to check it which you should trolling or casting or both this is what you'd be fishing right here again low water keep repeating that low water thing to them okay one can see right here that there's the saddle now, your trolling, parallel trolling passes be very difficult. So most of your trolling passes be made out of the deep water, across the saddle, and back into the deep water again, from different angles, of course. Okay? 
This is another typical saddle, okay? Just giving them a, when you're out on the lake and you observe this type of situation, there should be a saddle there. You've got to check it out. There's a big wee line. You see an interruption in the wee line. Something is different there. There's deep water in between those two, or they'd be connected by the weeds, chances are. This could be in a Florida lake. There may only be a six or nine foot channel in between those two weeds, but that's where the fish would be, between those two patches of weed line there. This shows the fish in the sanctuary, uh, and where the sanctuary would be in the saddle, okay? Now, the, the island between two channels. Now, we fished, this would be like Wiley, okay? Remember, we were on Wiley. We had the upstream side and the downstream side. The downstream side, as you saw, had the longer, narrower structure, okay? The upstream side was at abrupt little hump up there, all right? But you can't ignore the upstream side. It's got to be checked out. And as you know, it's one of the better places in the in the reservoir, okay? Uh, it's a good hot spot. Uh, the channel splits and it goes around the island just like it did down on Wiley. And it, here it shows that the, the contact point could be right off the end of it or it could be on the side. It's not necessarily right off the end. That could be flat right off the end too. And where the channel cut back in on the sides, that would form the sharp break so the fish may come up on the side, okay? And the, um, uh, the, uh, the upstream side of the island has to be checked out, too. And one thing you would look for on that upstream side of the island was humps. Why would there be a hump there? Because the channel split, it kept piling up the dirt and piling up the dirt. So you would look for a structure situation in form of a hump on the upstream side. Somebody may say to you, well, why don't you show a hump on there? Well, it may not have a hump. It's what you got to be alert yourself for. That, that's what you have to look for. You see how fast I'm moving through these slides? You know what I mean? Otherwise, you're dead in the water. You're, uh, two hours later, and you're, you know. And this just shows you a picture of an island with an upstream side and a downstream side. You see, the downstream side is much longer and narrower. Okay? And I would call attention to this. Let's say, let's look at this slide and because I, I do this to them. Let's look at this slide and say, let's say it was taken under low water situation, okay? Yeah, okay. This hump right here, right there, let's say that was underwater. You can see the hump that's formed here, that the, when, when, it, when the island was under a high water situation, it formed that big hump on the end right there. That would be something you would look for on the, on the uh, the um, upstream side of the island. I would call her attention to that because that gets the guy thinking right away, uh-oh, now I know what to look for on the upstream side. And you're giving him the whole answer, giving him information he can't get anywhere else. It's, uh, here shows another island, another picture of an island, okay? Pretty much of that's underwater. Okay, here's another one, upstream, downstream side. Now the reefs, um, in the past we didn't do much on the reefs and that was a big mistake. A lot of the, these big natural lakes like Lake Winnebago, Lake Erie and places like that, the only structure situation in the lake is a reef. You could troll the lake and try and find a reef, but boy it could take you a long time on those big natural lakes. Again by absorbing the shoreline terrain many times you can pick out something that should be a reef. Well, a reef should, should, could be in the area, which would mean it's a structure situation. What you're interested in that this reef goes all the way to the deepest water in the area. You may notice a reef by seeing some white caps out there. It looks like somebody could surf out there. There's something under the water out there. Something's causing that water to turn over out there. So that would be one way for your eyeballs, you're using your eyes, you could see if there's a reef. This is the greatest indicator here. A bunch of rocks coming off the shore, a rocky looking point in a big flat lake where the, it gets gradually deeper and deeper at Lake St. Clair in Michigan, same, same thing. What you want to see in your mind 
just like any other structure situation in this slide tray. What you want to see is what's there. You want the picture in your mind to be what's there with no water in the lake, okay? And we go to the next slide and we see it. There's that rocky reef going all the way to the deepest water in the area. This is what it looks like when we're out in the boat. This is the way we have to assume it looks like or check it out and, and picture this is what we want to see. This is another indicator out on Lake Winnebago or, or uh, Lake Erie or, or in some lakes. Uh, you can pick up rocky shorelines like that that indicate that a structure situation in the form of a reef might occur. And you'd start working out from there to see what you could find. This shows a rocky reef and it shows two guys in the casting position out there. Now you could refer to those two guys as spoon pluggers if you wanted to, because that's where the spoon plugger would be, sitting right out there anchoring and casting, you know. But just indicate to them, well, look how that reef just keeps running out and running out and running out. And even if the water was higher where you couldn't see it so good, proper presentation allures would take you out to the end of that reef. You get to this slide and you tell them how important this slide is because this would deal with uh, the big large glacier type lakes, uh, the three I mentioned, Winnebago, Erie, and St. Clair. As you see, you're following your way out there, you begin to see some parallel rocks and clean areas and, and whatever it may be that are parallel from the shore. Uh, they could be a mile out in the lake, they could be any distance out in the lake. And of course the weather and water the conditions are going to determine at which break line these fish are going to appear. You caught some of yourself if you remember on Lake Erie, 40 something feet deep. Okay, so here uh, as, we, as we look at these, we say, well, how are these formations created? Where did they come from? Uh, former water levels of these lakes, maybe a hundred years ago, for all we know. That's usually what causes this type of structure situation. In big, wide sweeping bars, if you have a contour map, it's very important. Uh, it may not be exact, it may not be real accurate, but you can bet that where the lines come close together, it indicates there's an abrupt change of depth somewhere around that depth. Instead of 15 feet, it might be 18 feet. It might be 13 feet. But there's an abrupt change of depth there along the side of the bar. The end of the bar, you note for those guys, is long and flat. The brakes are on the side. Now, it says, uh, you tell them that uh, you may get out there and there may not just be one finger out there, there may be three in that area. And you, you say to yourself, well, which one is it? Which one's it gonna be? Well, if all three break equally into the deep water, which isn't likely, but say they do, you let the fish tell you which one it is. They'll tell you. Now we're gonna cover a wide sweeping bar. And uh, I cover each one of these sentences right here. Okay, to get away from that depth finder. Do you understand what I mean? That they can't follow a certain depth on the depth finder because the contours are uneven. You're in six feet of water, then it's eight, then it's nine, then it's four, then it's six, then it's eight, then it's nine. But when we map the bar, we don't start just contour trolling it. When we map the bar with the use of the depth finder, that dotted line right, right there is established by the mapper. That's the spoon plugger's interpretation of the shape of the bar. The bar has four fingers on it. That means that he's got, he's got on at each one of those fingers, there's an abrupt change of depth that takes place. But the spoon plugger has established that. That's his interpretation of the shape of the bar. At these various depths that you see here on the fingers, that's where the bars break. If we go all the way to the right, we see that a bar that, that bar breaks from 6 to 24 feet. The next one is 12 to 25, 19 to 36, 16 to 29. The spoon plugger established these depths, that an abrupt change of depth took place at these depths at that, uh, on those spots, on those fingers. Well, for all intents and purposes, until proven otherwise, the one that breaks from 19 to 36 feet should be the contact point because it drops off into the deepest water in the lake. So the spoon plugger would expect that to be the contact point. 
Now let's change that depth from 19 feet and let's make it 12 feet. And it still goes from 12 to 36 and the other one went from 19 to 25. We just exchanged those two. The 12 to 36 is still the contact point because it's still the deepest break going to the deepest water. It doesn't say the deepest break on the bar. It says the, the deepest break going to, uh, breaking the sharpest into the deepest water. And whether it was 12 feet up there or 19 feet or 16 feet, it would still be the contact point. And this shows a, a bar, big wide sweeping bar in the low water conditions. Shows several fingers, this is another one. Big wide sweeping bar. This is another one. Big wide sweeping bar, low water conditions. This is just to give them an idea of how big it could be. You could see fingers beginning to form out there. And this is one that had some weeds on it. But that would indicate a big wide sweeping bar. If you look at the shoreline terrain and you see how far out that big flat comes with the weeds sticking up out of the water, that shows you there's a big wide sweeping bar there. That's an indication. This would take place on a natural lake more than a reservoir. Yeah, maybe a well. uh, Then we see a bar between uh, two channels, where two channels come together and we form a main channel. Uh, it can happen out in the reservoir where two big creek channels come together and form and form the main channel. It can be up in a feeder creek. Uh, you can go up that creek arm on the right, and that channel may split again further up the creek arm. Each and every time the channel splits, it forms a structure situation. There's a bar between the two channels. Same slide. There's a bar between two channels. You see the, the feeder creek coming out on the left side and then another creek coming out on the right side and it forms a long ridge type structure. And this is the perfect slide, the perfect slide. You see the long ridge type structure and where it's at, right there where the two channels come together. And this picture here, this slide here, this tells them the whole story. When they see this, this is under a, a low water situation. When they see this, they know right where the bar is. So anytime there's a split in that channel or where two feeder creeks come into the main channel and they, they'll form a structure situation there and that's where the fish will be. That's something you look for. Here's another one, another good slide where the two come together. Side feeder stream cuts occur all over the country uh, in a lot of reservoirs. Uh, the biggest thing that we want them to do uh, is that they'll go all the way to the deepest water in the area. This is an example of a side feeder stream cut coming into the reservoir. There's another side feeder stream cut, but this one's a little bit further from shore. It's getting close to a wide floodplain type reservoir, but it can be found in the lowland and flatland reservoirs especially. They're not too far out in the lake yet, but they're still, they're still far enough out where uh, uh, you have to know what you're looking for. I tell them to always observe the shoreline terrain, look where the feeder stream begins to come in, uh, feeder stream comes off the shoreline, and that should indicate that that cut is there, and then you want to see if it goes all the way. And don't give up on it because it may not be straight like that one. It may go on an angle to the left or to the right. This is an example under low water. It shows a cut. It shows it going all the way to the main channel. This is the one here. This is the one that here makes you or breaks you. Most of this is in the flatland reservoir or the wide floodplain type reservoir. It can be 250 yards from shore or more. The contact points are out on the end of the bar where the feeder cut and the main channel come together. There's a lot of flats in between. The path to the shoreline is the feeder cut itself. That's the path the fish take into the shallows to spawn. Ten months out of the year, approximately ten months out of the year, the contact point will always be right where the main channel and the feeder cut come together, right. In the pre-spawn, people want to know where to find them. 
as that feeder cut winds and twists its way up toward the shallows, those short bars that you see coming off the shore up there would, could be hot spots. They could be the contact point. The fish would remain in the feeder cut itself. There could be 17, 16, 18, 20 feet of water in the feeder cut at that time. And on those short bars could be six or seven or eight feet on the top of them. And these fish should have still regular movement periods where they come out of the cut and move up on those bars. So in the pre-spawn and the post-spawn, you want to make sure you check the short bars that are related to the feeder cut. That's where the fish are going to be. This shows another feeder cut coming into the main channel, low water again. Okay? This is what it would look like with no water in the lake. This is the excellent slide. Here's the feeder cut that goes all the way. We see it winds and twists a little bit. The fish could pause or stop for days anywhere in that feeder cut for days in preparation to move it into the shallows to spawn. The two humps on either side of the cut are those little bars down here at the bottom of the slide. Those fish follow that path right to the shallows. Yeah. Again, it's low water. Next thing we deal with is a steep shoreline again, okay? Many times there's a bunch of rock ledges and so on and fingers and uh, little break lines and washes and, and stuff on these steep shores and some of them step down almost like steps. And it, it seems like an easy situation to fish. And what could we expect to find there as far as the fish relating to it? Well, this makes it look kind of easy. We've got different breaks at different depths and it seems to be here that if we keep moving deeper and deeper and deeper, the fish are going to get larger and larger. Well, and most of these movements take place during the colder uh, parts of the season in, in, in the areas where the ice, there's not ice on the water in the southern reservoirs. And uh, this is where you'd want to look for the, the movements, however short they may be. What seems easy to fish in reality looks like this underneath the water. Now suddenly it doesn't become so easy. It becomes a hang up heaven. So you have, to, you have to make up your own mind. Is the particular wash or set of, set of ledges that you're fishing, is the structure fishable? Or are you going to be hung up all the time on the troll and hung up all the time on the cast? This particular one means trouble. On the other hand, this one, shown again under a low water condition, if that was the existing steep shore, that could be fished rather easily with just a few hang-ups hang on a big rock or something. So that's fishable, trolling and casting. It may look smooth to you from the lake, the steep shore, but don't let that fool you. It may not be smooth all the way down. <laughs> it may get pretty bad because remember, as you get to the bottom of this hill, before the water was in the lake, you run into the old creek bed shoreline, and that's where all the trees and brush and roots and, and everything is at, and anything that falls off that steep shore. I just tell them here that um, when you get to a reservoir such as this, and you see it's down about 35, 40 feet, and you see it's in a highland-type reservoir, the area could be down by the dam. Uh, it could be just a plain highland-type reservoir. It's clear water, steep shorelines. There's nothing but washes and slides in the lake to fish, and not very many of those. Best thing you can do is get out of there. That's not an advi that's not advisable to fish there. But if you have to fish there, the slides and the washes again become the key to this one too. This would be a sample of it under a low water condition. The biggest thing you got to worry about about humps is a dead end, something that leads nowhere. The hump that you see with the marker buoy on top of it, the hump that you see with the marker buoy on top of it, if it's about eight to ten feet of water on top, and remember the, the water level can vary, so it could be four or five feet of water on top, certainly it would get shallow enough for the fish to spawn. 
So a school of bass could exist right there, smallmouth or largemouth, because they could spawn right on top of it. Now, if we put 15 to 25 feet of water on top of that particular hump, now the fish are going to need a path to the shallows in order to spawn. That they're going to need. If they don't have a path to the shallows, you won't find any bass there. But you may find fish that roam through the channel in a, in a, in a reservoir, or fish that ro roam and move through the, the basin of the lake in a natural lake. They may appear on that hump at any time. That would be the striper, the walleye, the northern, and the muskie. They don't need that particular path to the shallows to spawn, like the largemouth and smallmouth bass do. So their characteristics or little spawning characteristics are different. So keep that in mind. It's either got to be shallow enough on top at one time or another, or there has to be a path around it to the shallows for the fish to spawn. The next slide can be kind of confusing. So if we forget about the bottom half of it for the time being and look at the top half, we see that the contact point is at the top, is, is on the side at the left. The dotted line represents a 15-foot break line established by the spoon plugger. The 8-foot hump is also established by the spoon plugger, as are the depths behind the hump. So there's definitely a saddle in there, and we know that that's not, that's not uh, sanctuary depth. Now, there was some controversy as to why we caught so many big bass on this bar, because it seemingly it didn't have a path to the shallows. But what's missing off this particular drawing here is as we come to our left, we go around the hump and we follow the dotted line at 15 feet. It would keep going down, down, down to the bottom, and it goes down into a big shallow bay, and that break line would be changing from 15 feet to 12 feet to 10 feet to 8 feet to 6 feet to 4 feet as we went into the shallow bay. So the path to the shallows for the bass to spawn in was, would start out down that 15-foot break line, and they would follow that break line as it changed right down into the shallow bay and spawn. That was their path to the shoreline. Now, if we go to the right-hand side of that point, the, the, there wasn't a bay, a shallow bay. It was just a weedy, a, a short weedy area, and there was nowhere for them to spawn, so consequently we didn't catch any bass off that finger on the right. This is an actual structure situation of a lake in Wisconsin, okay? So we have to explain this slide a little bit, but there is a path to the shallows, okay? Water? Yeah, I couldn't really <laughs> use one. I've been talking a lot the last couple oh. of days. This shows how the hump may appear in an artificial reservoir. We see a hump up there in the shallows up in the flat. You may find some panfish or catfish or something up there, but there won't be any bass up there. Those bass will not go up and over that hump and down the other side. They don't know anything about the shoreline. That hump is the shoreline for them, okay? That deep water hump, you could catch some stripers or muskies or northerns or walleyes off that particular hump if the situation was just like it is. But basically for the bass, it's a dead end. If you put any distance between the base of that, the, the, the uh, structure uh, feature on the left side and that, they'd never find that. They wouldn't move on it. But fish like the walleye, the northern, and the muskie, and the striper, they're constantly roaming through the channel or basin of a natural lake. They, they could appear on there from time to time, regardless of how deep it was. Low water again, and this shows a hump. This indicates that there's a hump there. We see it sticking up, okay? This is where you observe, again, Remember what you saw, you showed me about method one, two, three, about mapping the bar, remember that? Remember the way you started it out, observing the terrain? This is typical. Guys, how am I going to find a hump in a bit? Well, that way, or on the next slide, there's stick sticking up. Now, that stick <laughs> is not going to be very long, okay? And maybe some guy came along and stuck that stick in there so he could always find the hump because he didn't know how to take line sights or, 
or whatever. But when you see a stick sticking up, that's far from sure. You better go over there and see why the stick is sticking up. Okay? Again, you're observing this with your eyes. Here we go again, just like we did with the reef. We see the water beginning to turn over out there. It's not turning over anywhere else. We say to ourselves, we're on a great big natural lake. We're on Winnebago, or we're on, uh, we're on uh, uh, Lake St. Clair, or Lake Erie, or you could use some too, you know, up in your area. And uh, we see that water turning over in, the, in, the, in that, couple, that little area right there. There's a hump out there. So we didn't find it with a depth finder. We'd roam around. Look at the size of that lake. We'd roam around forever out there looking for a hump. But just by what we could observe with our eyes, we've got to constantly be aware, constantly be looking. We're going to deal with the delta situation now that has to do with feeder cuts and uh, uh, big, wide floodplain type reservoirs. Uh, there'll be big, long flats running out from the shoreline out to the main river channel. The uh, break lines will vary as you move from the headwaters toward the dam. They'll usually get deeper as you go toward the dam and shallower toward the headwaters. The most important thing is the feeder cut. The contact points where the, where the fish are going to, to uh, appear, first appear, again, are going to be where the feeder cut comes into the main channel. They have people say on the upstream side or the downstream side. And you get, this, you get them with this one before they even ask you, which side? Yeah, these, these feeder cuts are not going to be that wide apart. Let the fish tell you which side. Yeah, don't just don't just work the upstream side or downstream side. Um, there's a lot of trolling water there, which would be that delta hump. But that's just what it is, trolling water. The contact points where the the the, the main channel and the feeder cut intersect. That's the key spot. Then you say to a wash or a slide, is that a structure situation? Not really, but it may prove to be because there's nothing to stop these fish, as you saw in Lake Wiley from moving along that break line and appearing at the wash as well as the cut. There's nothing to stop them from doing that. So the, the wash could become a structure situation. And as it says there on the slide, casting water, a fish are caught here on the troll. Okay? Now this, this gives us a, a little bit different view of the situation. Uh, most of the time, we can't reach the base break line in most cases uh, in a reservoir. But in this particular one, we do. Well, if we can reach it, and if we can fish right at the base of the, of the particular structure, right at the base where the cut enters the main channel, we can troll that if we can reach it on the troll. But we can fish it more thoroughly on the cast from an anchored position because we're only concentrating our efforts right there where the, the main channel and the feeder cut intersect. So we can work it much better on the cast. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes with a trolling pass on the base of it, we tend to drift out and away into nothing, okay? We're on the cast, we're anchored right here, they are coming straight up, we can't miss. This is a low water and it shows the delta situation. That's a nice clean one there. <laughs> no trees or rock, bushes or nothing on that one. <laughs> you know, it would pay that if they drop the water, go out there and clean some of that garbage off oh, of there. Yeah. You know what I mean? This really shows you the, the delta. I mean, it's amazing that it would exist like that. There goes that phone. <clears throat> Is it being okay? Do I just keep going here? While you... <clears throat> a riprap. You don't have to say too much about riprap because the slides are going to really show them. Uh, the good thing about riprap is it may be the only clean structure in the lake. And why is that? Well, it's because that's where all the construction went on. That's where they cut down all the trees and they dug out the hole and they, they did all the things that they had to do. And um, it may be the only place you can fish where you don't run into a bunch of trees or brush, and it's good structure, and you know one thing. The dam usually has the deepest water in the reservoir, and it's the cleanest structure, and you know there's some fish there. 
Unfortunately, it could be the clearest water in the lake at the same time, unfortunately, okay? But again, check it out. One buck always adds to this. It's always added. Keep your eye on the dam area. If it's clear most of the year, there may be a change at some time or another, maybe a heavy rain. He said, the minute you get color, that's the time to hit the riprap at the dam. If it gets color, you better go there. Because you know there's fish there, and most likely, there are fish that nobody could reach through most of the fishing season. <clears throat> this just shows you a long, long dam with a lot of riprap. Same here. And a spoon plugger trolling down. You could say whatever you want about this. A couple of spoon pluggers going down the riprap. This is just a shot of a dam and a road behind it. Okay, you'd be driving down that road. Yeah. Well, that's coming up. Oh. Yeah, that comes up. <laughs> this is the backside of the dam here, but it's not where you get to the tail race yet. Oh, you know, okay. he's just got a lot of pictures of. Uh, front and back of the dam. Well, back, it was looking there to see where the old channel came through. Yeah, that yeah, the... yeah. Here's the tail race, okay? This is why you can't fish in the tail race most mm -hmm. of the time. All the snags, yeah. all the monofilament yeah. line and guys along the shore. <clears throat> now this is the one. You tell them before you even put the boat in the water, you could do yourself a big favor. Cross the road, go across the dam, park the boat, see if they diverted the tail race, see if they diverted the water. If they did, the dried up old creek channel will tell you right where the main channel comes up against the riprap. Now that, and tell them that could be five or six miles across, three miles, two miles, whatever it is, you save yourself a lot of trouble. Right there. One of these numbers here, where yeah. this is diverted. Right. Point out here. Yeah. yeah. Like on Monroe. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, what I wait for is till I get to the Monroe slide because it's not on there yeah. and they can't see it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> if okay. they can't see it, they have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> same, same thing, different slide. Okay. Again, the dried up creek bed, and you see that where they diverted the water. Submerged roadbeds, one thing that you want to make sure is that they go all the way, okay? And they're perfect routes if they do. Uh, you, you know doggone well they cross the, the, the old creek, so they go all the way to the old creek bed. Now, what I, what I do sometimes is tell them how to troll it. It's up to you because the question comes up, how the heck do you troll that, that roadbed? Well, you can't troll up it. It gets shallow too fast. You can't troll down it. It gets deep too fast. So if you troll it like you troll a long, narrow bar, you can't contour troll around it. You don't want to just make parallel passes, so you cross it like an X. You put that marker at 10 feet or whatever to separate the shallows from the deep water. You run the 250, 400, and 500 inside, and the bigger lures on the outside with straight line passes. Hit it on that angle, hit it on that angle, hit it straight across, and just keep working your way out. That way you have a piece of it every time. You can't go up it, and you can't go down it. Gets shallow too fast, gets deep too fast. In other words, by the time you go with the small lures, you'll be up on the parking lot. <laughs> now, what happens in the south a lot, and in, in, even in some place in the north, Instead of building a boat ramp, they'll use an old existing road as the ramp. So you, when you see this from the water, or say you're putting your boat in here, either way, you've got to see, does this go all the way? Does it go to the channel? Because chances are, this is what's happening right here. We just took the water out of there. On the low water, you see it goes all the way to the deepest water in the area. And if it does, it's definitely a structure situation and something you've got to check out. It shows another one, okay? Now this particular thing, fence rows and hedgerows, uh, uh, a lot of the cooling lakes 
have this type of structure because they're nothing but old farmland, Commonwealth Edison and, and places like that. So what? And they also have burrow pits, and the burrow pit could have 70 feet of water in it, surrounded by 20 feet, a 20 foot break line going into it, and big flats all around it. People say it's got 70 feet of water in it. I never catch a bass. No, you're not going to catch a bass. It has no path to the shoreline, no path to the shallows, no way for them to get to the shallows to spawn. You may get some rough fish out there and some panfish. That's all you're going to catch out there. The fish in this in, the, in these cooling lakes also have to have a path to the shallows. And how do they get there? One of the most common structures in those type of reservoirs, and you find them in Kansas and Nebraska and a lot of that flatland country, Iowa, is a hedgerow and the fence row. Again, they've got to go all the way to the deepest water in the area. Most of the time they do, unless somebody's done something with it. And the guy says, well, why would the fence go all the way? What do you mean by go all the way? You tell him it goes all the way to the old creek bed. And he said, well, why would it go all the way? The farmer builds the fence all the way to the creek so the cows can't go around the fence and get out. So it goes all the way to the water. Now, if nobody interrupts that fence row or hedge row, it's a perfect path to the shallows for the fish. And you'll have a school of bass, and the contact point will be right out there where the fence row enters the old creek bed, which is now the main river channel. There's another slide indicating the same thing. This shows the hedgerow right here. There's a hedgerow running out into the lake. There's a good shot of one, real long hedgerow. You could put a fence on top of it, and there'd be a fence row. See, you don't have to say too much about that. You know, it's pretty self-explanatory. Just skip right over it, go by it. Uh, causeways are very important. They're always clean structure situations and something that has to be checked out. There's usually deep water there because at some point on the causeway, the main channel goes underneath a bridge on the causeway. Okay, the riprap along the causeway is is a good structure situation. It's clean structure, and with the with the addition of the channel, which gives you the deep water, it becomes a, an excellent structure situation. Okay, and then you can talk about everything that's on this slide. Okay, the, the, the writing on there. Then you tell them that in some reservoirs there'll be bridges that cross the reservoir near the headwaters. And the land around there, the terrain, will be flat. This particular uh, type of a bridge is, is called a pinnacle bridge. It doesn't have much rip raft at all, or very short, short amounts of rip raft, a very short trolling run or, or whatever. And most of it is open water underneath that bridge. But you know the channel goes underneath the bridge somewhere. There's also a structure situation that can exist where bars existed when they built the bridge and they put the abutments right on the bars. Then you point out the, the, the contact points where the fish will come up out of the channel. The channel's clearly marked. The brakes are the abutments and the little brake lines that drop down into the channel. Okay? When conditions are good, they move, may move all the way up and scatter along that short riprap. Most of the time, you can expect the movement to be, end right there on that brake line outside the abutment. That's far as they'll come. Some little fish caught on the shoreline around the Pinnacle Bridge, this may exist. You gotta check it out. And what does a Pinnacle Bridge look like? It looks like that. No causeway, no rocks, very little shoreline to really fish. Some Pinnacle Bridges will be uh, like at Mid Lake, There'll be river channel, shoreline to shoreline, because they built it in the narrowest part of the reservoir. This particular slide is an actual structure situation in Monroe Reservoir in Bloomington, Indiana. And uh, it was mapped out, you say, by a bunch of spoon pluggers. Now, several questions come up about this. As you explain that they diverted the channel, put the bridge toward yonder shoreline down here, uh, the guy is inevitably going to ask you, why didn't they put the bridge out in the middle of the reservoir? Why did they go through the trouble of diverting the water? 
because it's easier to divert the water and build a bridge next to shore instead of bringing all their heavy equipment out into the middle of the reservoir to do it. That's why they did it. It's very easy for them. You just describe to them, it's like building something in the sand when you were a kid. You dig it out like that with your hand, and you let the water come in it, and it just flows. And that's what they did. But they built the bridge close to shore so they wouldn't have to go out and all the muck after the rain and, and I got heavy equipment out there and everything. They did it all right here. But what they did is they created those structure situations, okay? Like we talked about the contact points are out there on the ends. When you're catching little fish on the riprap or no fish on the riprap, you better check right where those channels split, okay? And by building the bridge down here and diverting the water, they gave us three schools of fish. We knew we had a school of fish on the left side, school of fish on the right side, but they gave us another one under the bridge. Okay? And then this next slide really explains it. There's a riprap, low water situation, and there's the main channel coming right up against the rocks. Where's the contact point? Out there on the tip of that, right, right. So that really describes it for them, you know? Then when I get into the pictures, uh, you know, I always talk about this big bass. What, if we looked at all these structure situations, okay? Inevitably, <laughs> if you take any questions, the guy will say, well, I fish for stripers too. Can I catch stripers off these structures? Even though you mentioned it during the lecture, okay? So you run through this, you say, these are the type of fish that can be caught off the various structure situations, the various 17 structure situations. And you show the bass, and you, you move through, okay? And people say they're all bad, and they say northern pike, okay? Uh, more bass, okay? There's some northern and walleye that can be caught off these structure situations. You move on muskie, 